Hello and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the pre-launch news conference for NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 mission. This will be SpaceX's third flight with crew to the International Space Station as part of the agency's commercial crew program. I'm Marie Lewis with NASA Public Affairs, and we have several experts here uh, to break down this mission for us. To my left is Steve Stitch, manager of NASA's commercial crew program, Joel Montalbano, manager of NASA's International Space Station program, Benji Reed, senior director of human spaceflight programs at SpaceX, Norm Knight, deputy director of NASA's flight operations, Junichi Sakai, manager of JAXA's International Space Station program, Frank Davina, manager of ESA's International Space Station program, Kurt Costello, chief scientist for NASA's International Space Station program, and Brian Sizek, launch weather officer with the U.S. Air Force's 45th Weather Squadron. Now, you may also have noticed uh, a pair of spacesuits behind our speakers in the room. These are the actual spacesuits worn by astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley during the historic Demo-2 test flight last year. And we have them here as a nod to all that the NASA and SpaceX teams have accomplished. We will take your questions after opening remarks from our guests, and we'll start with Steve Stitch. Thanks, Marie. It's uh, great to be here today. Um, we had our launch readiness review this morning, uh, jointly between NASA and SpaceX. We reviewed all the open work uh, coming out of the agency flight readiness review and uh, the, the systems on the vehicles, and we concluded that we're go for launch. So we're still on track for a 611 Eastern launch on Thursday, April the 22nd. That would uh, put docking on Friday, April 23rd at around uh, 4.30 a.m. if we uh, launch on, uh, on Thursday as planned. Uh, over the last 48 hours, uh, it's been a very busy time frame uh, here. Of course, on Saturday, we had the static fire of the first stage of the Crew-2 vehicle, fired all of the nine uh, Merlin engines and reviewed all the data from that. Those looked really good, compared really well to the, uh, the Crew-1 flight. And so no issues coming out of that static fire. Um, on Sunday, the crew got in the vehicle. They suited up in the, in the suit room in ONC, and they walked through that whole timeline of how they'll go out to the launch pad and get in the vehicle and uh, get in their suits and hook the suits up to the vehicle, close the hatch, and the systems on the vehicle performed well. The suits all performed great. It was a great uh, dress rehearsal for launch. Uh, as we talked about uh, after the flight readiness review, we did have one issue that we needed to resolve. That was the additional uh, locks that we, liquid oxygen that we thought was on the vehicle from several uh, other SpaceX flights. We looked at that relative to this flight and we concluded that uh, that amount of liquid oxygen in the first stage was well within family of the guidance navigation control analysis and performance analysis. Uh, well within the loads and structural capability of the vehicle and that we could handle any uh, contingencies with that locks on board. So we were go to proceed uh, with that uh, amount of locks on the vehicle and uh, we closed the, we have an, had an exception at the flight readiness review, we closed that. I signed that exception and Kathy Leader signed that as well. Uh, the main thing we're watching over the next few days is the weather. Uh, you know, we have to have the launch weather be go and also abort weather all along the abort ground track to protect the crew in the vehicle. So we'll be looking at both uh, Thursday and Friday and looking at the weather over the next few days. It's just an exciting time to be here. You know, before coming over here, uh, Benji Reed and I were out at the launch pad and was thinking about all three crewed missions. This is our third. Uh, the capsule that we're gonna fly is a reused capsule that Bob and Doug flew on Demo 2. And then the first stage was used by Crew 1. So it's kind of exciting to see all those three missions in that one vehicle at the pad. Um, thanks, Marie. I'll turn it over to Joel. Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome again to today's uh, post-launch readiness review press brief. You know, the month of April has been and will continue to be a banner month for the International Space Station. Um, every week in the month of April, we have or will do uh, a major human spaceflight dynamic activity. We started the month with a Dragon relocation from the Node 2 forward port to the Zenith port. We followed just a few days later by a Soyuz launch and brought the crew complement on board to 10 people. Um, just last Friday, we had a Soyuz landing, so three people came home, and it allowed us to have 10 people on orbit for about a week, preparing us for the Crew-1, Crew-2 handover mission, where we'll have 11 people on board. 
Our life support systems uh, worked fabulously, no, no issues at all. And uh, while we're prepared and planning for just a short five-ish day mission, we're prepared to have uh, both crew one and crew two up there from a consumable standpoint for up to 20 days. Um, this week, we're here talking about the Crew 2 launch, and then the last week of the month, we'll have the Crew 1 undock and landing. So, like I said, just an, an awesome time to be in human space flight and, and just a great place to be working on the International Space Station. With the Crew 2 launch, we welcome the European Space Agency's uh, flying an astronaut for the first time on Dragon. We also um, welcome back the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency flying on Dragon for a second time. So truly an international program, and, and this is our future, where we'll have international partners on our vehicles uh, for the future. That's a goal, and, and that's where we're planning to be. Uh, this crew will stay up a full duration, you know, approximately six months. They'll perform over 260 experiments on board. And one of the major benefits of the commercial crew program is where with the fourth crew member, we're allowed to increase the amount of utilization and research we do on board, the amount of technology development we do for the Artemis program, as well as the low Earth orbit commercialization efforts we do. So just an awesome, awesome time again to be working on the International Space Station. As I talked after the flight readiness review, April 22nd is Earth Day. And just a reminder, we have a number of experiments on board that are Earth facing, collecting data every day for our scientists to study the Earth. We also have uh, activities on board, for example, water recovery, that we can repurpose that technology and use it to benefit people here on Earth. So we're excited for this mission. We want to congratulate the commercial crew program, congratulate the SpaceX team. And with that, I'll hand it over to Benji. Great, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Steve. Um, as always, it's an honor to be here. Uh, we're excited um, to be able to fly crew again. Um, it's uh, super cool to, to have the opportunity to do this so quickly, in fact. Um, and uh, it's a great note. I think if I do my math right, we'll in less than a year have flown as many people in this partnership with NASA um, as we're flown in the Mercury program. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, number one, always, we want to thank um, the agencies and our partners, NASA, the Japanese Space Agency, and the European Space Agency, and of course the families of all of the astronauts um, for their trust in, uh, in allowing us to fly their astronauts, their family members um, to space and to bring them home safely again. Um, not only in this last year uh, have we flown so many uh, and we'll have the opportunity to fly so many more uh, humans to space, but uh, we also had a couple of other records. It was our first uh, commercial orbital space launch of humans um, in history um, and also our longest mission, the longest mission for an American crew vehicle um, in history. So um, a lot of firsts and a lot of good stuff happening. Another thing that I think is really uh, great is that in less than 11 months, the joint NASA and SpaceX team were able to certify reuse. Um, so we are flying, as Steve mentioned, we're flying uh, NASA astronauts on a flight-proven Dragon and a flight-proven Falcon. Um, and so that'll be a, another first and a very important thing, as we all have talked before, uh, flying um, on, on reuse vehicles, on flight-proven vehicles is key towards greater flight reliability and lowering the cost of access to space which is ultimately what helps us make life multiplanetary. Um, so this is a, a great accomplishment, and, and again, a huge thank you to the NASA teams that worked with us and the international partner teams that have all worked with us to make that a, a reality coming up this week. Um, we'd also like to thank NASA for the award um, for the Human Lander System. This is a huge honor, um, and, uh, and it's, it's truly a great thing for us to be able to be a part of the Artemis team, and, uh, and we look forward to making that happen. Um, that program itself, just like the Commercial Crew Program, just like the International Space Station and the programs before it, are pushing human exploration further than ever before, and particularly will push human exploration in a more diverse way than ever before. And this is a great thing. Um, right now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Crew 2 vehicles and uh, where we stand right now on our launch pad. And we have a video, I think. All right, this is a great drone video. This is what uh, the pad looks like right now. This was taken a couple of days ago, but I was just out there, as Steve mentioned, and you can see it. Um, great views here of Falcon. Um, you can see the, uh, the NASA logos on the side. Um, you can see uh, the Dragon on top. 
the crew arm is extended exactly where the crew will walk across and get into their, their vehicle to go to space. Um, as many of you will remember, that is the, the same tower that was, has been used by the shuttle teams and also by the Apollo crews uh, when they flew to the moon. So it's always an honor to be here at this historic launch pad here at Kennedy Space Center. Um, this, uh, our vehicles and the launch pad and all of our teams are ready. We continue to do a number of tests preparing, uh, I should say a number of analyses of our data, assessments of our data. We've completed thousands and thousands of tests to get to this day, just like we always have in the past and will continue to do. Um, we talk a, a lot about uh, these kinds of reviews that we do. We call them paranoia reviews. Um, they're, they, we we, we want to be paranoid, right? We want to make sure that we're going to fly these people safely and, and be able to bring them home safely when it's time. So we check. We check under every rock and we double check and we triple check and we ask each other and we challenge each other all the time. We're continuing that process. Another thing that we do is we practice a lot. Um, and uh, one of the practices that we did was the dry dress rehearsal. And that's where the crew actually gets suited up. Um, they get into uh, their vehicles, the Model Xs that come across and bring them out to the pad. Um, they go up in that tower that you saw there and across the crew arm, they get into the seats in the Dragon and basically walk through everything on the timeline as if it were launch day. Um, while the crew's doing that, the ground teams are all doing their jobs and all of our flight operators are in their seats back in Hawthorne, here at the Cape and elsewhere, um, doing, walking through the steps, walking through the procedures um, and ensuring that we're ready to go. And we take that, that dry dress up through basically the moment of launch. Um, and uh, ensure that we're, that, that we're going to be ready and practice that. And in fact, our teams are actually doing um, even uh, additional practices. Um, like I mentioned, we, we continue to uh, want to ensure that everything is great. And so we're continuing down that path as we get ready for Thursday. Um, speaking of that dry dress, I think we've got some photos. Ah, there it is. Great shot. Again, you can see um, the, uh, the vehicle, but uh, in front of the vehicle down there is the crew. And um, uh, we should always talk about who they are and who they are as people. We've got Megan and Shane and Hockey and Toma. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of families there. There's a lot of hard work and time that they've put in, the, the astronauts and also their families and all the people who've supported them over the years. It's important that they are able to get up and do their job on the space station, do all the great science that the station does. And, um, and it, it, in particular in my heart, I know there's a, there's a little boy out there whose mom is flying. And uh, this is something that we pay a lot of attention to. We ask ourselves all the time, would we be willing to fly our families on these vehicles? And that's kind of a test for us. And this is a great shot of them. And, and, and if you get to know them and watch them and they go through training, you, they're just a, a fun team, uh, an excellent team. Um, I think they designed a great patch. Um, and you can see them there in the crew arm right now. All right, let me just talk a moment about weather. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll hear more uh, from our weather officer about the local weather and the launch weather, but it's always a good reminder that it's not just about launch day when we're launching crew. We have to worry about the entire ascent trajectory because if something goes wrong, we want Dragon to be able to launch escape off of the rocket. Um, and that means they have to be able to come down in the ocean at all points along that potential escape path. So we're watching weather, not just here at the Cape, but all along that path up the northern seaboard across the Atlantic. Um, and so, and, and we're not just looking at say, you know, rain or something like that. We're looking at winds and wave height and lightning, um, all kinds of things to make sure it's right. So many, many points along that track, we're watching it. So fundamentally, there are a number of places where we can say, uh, we don't feel good enough about flying the crew today. Um, and so while we're aiming for Thursday, as Steve talked about at 611 Eastern, we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll watch the weather and we'll make a decision. If we need to, we'll move to that next day on Friday. Um, and just in terms of the launch opportunities, uh, based on uh, orbits of the space station, uh, we'll have two days on and two days off. So our first two launch opportunities are here Thursday and Friday. As Steve mentioned, a we'll, little bit less than 24 hours, we'll be docking to the space station based on this first opportunity. Um, and, um, and, you know, they'll be up there for about six months um, and it's important always to be thinking about the crew that we'll be bringing home just a few days after that. And of course, bringing that crew home is very important. Um, our, all of our recovery crews are ready. They also have been training and reviewing and practicing and checking all of their hardware. Um, and they're ready for those, those crews to come home and come and get them. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, I think it's always important to thank all of the different groups. There's a lot of the NASA centers that are involved. Of course, we've got Kennedy and Johnson and Marshall who all 
um, play a key role on the commercial crew program and supporting us. And of course, we have the 45th Space Wing um, here at the uh, Canaveral Space Force Station um, and DET3, who also is there to support us in case of an emergency. Thank you to all of them. And, and again, just thank you to the astronauts and their families. We look forward to flying you to space. Norm? Let's see. Uh, well, good morning. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues. Uh, it's an exciting time. We're 48 hours from launch, and, you know, this is where all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed as we, as we all count down to, uh, to launch time. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk with Shane. Uh, the crew is doing great. They're really excited. Uh, as Benji uh, said, dry dress went very well. And, uh, again, just uh, on our way to launch. Uh, the crew is getting an opportunity today to get more briefings, uh, get prepped for launch, spend some time with their family. They get a little bit of downtime tomorrow, uh, waking up very uh, early on uh, Thursday morning uh, for the launch. You know, the reviews that have been talked a lot about uh, culminated today with the launch readiness review, and, and those reviews have been extremely thorough, and especially with the refurbished Falcon and Dragon. Uh, we're very convinced that it's safe to fly. Safety has been number one in all these reviews, and that's the way it should be. Um, this business of human space flight is unforgiving. It's the vigilance uh, from the teams that guarantee that continued safety, and it was definitely present in these reviews this week. And, uh, you know, you step back and you look, it's, it's, it's hard enough in a regular environment, but you put COVID on top of that. It's been exceptionally impressive with these teams have been able to uh, to pull together. Uh, the cadence is very good for the teams uh, between SpaceX and NASA. Uh, people are working well with each other. Uh, we're looking forward to a successful mission. And again, it's just a very exciting time. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> On behalf of JAXA, uh, first of all, on behalf of JAXA, I would like to uh, sincerely thank NASA leadership and uh, SpaceX, the old colleagues who worked so hard for crew to launch a preparation and continuing ISS operation under such tough situations. Com count down to the crew to launch is close to beginning. It is a great pleasure for me to hear to be here with you. I welcomed a crew to crew at the LCC last Friday. They looked uh, so cheerful and confident. I spoke with the Japanese astronaut Hoshide, Hoshide Akihiko Aki. I have confidence he is ready for the launch. The Japanese experimental module Kibo is also ready for ready and waiting for a new crew's uh, arrival. I am very excited uh, at uh, two Japanese uh, two Japanese astronauts uh, Noguchi Soichi and Aki will get will will meet uh, will meet together in orbit. I'm looking forward to the coming uh, launch and wishing a great success. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning here in the US and uh, good afternoon all in uh, Europe that are following this. I would also like to start to uh, thank the uh, NASA and the SpaceX teams to uh, get us this far and this close to the launch. Uh, we are very excited, of course, that uh, for the first time a European astronaut, uh, Thomas, can uh, also fly on the Crew Dragon to the International Space Station. The ESA teams here in, uh, in the Cape, uh, but also in Europe already, uh, to support the launch and to support, of course, the Alpha mission in its entirety in the International Space Station. Uh, as Joel mentioned, it's an exciting time. Uh, we have four USOS crew members on orbit uh, and so we have uh, plenty of crew time available to do the science that we need to do on behalf of uh, the European Space Agency, the European scientists, but also scientists uh, 
around the world. Uh, some highlights, we have uh, the grip grasp experiment, for example, that Thomas commissioned during his first flight uh, and installed, and uh, he's now going to do uh, the final subject for this, uh, for this experiment uh, as well. Uh, we will do some uh, experiments around uh, immunology uh, and we can all uh, understand, I think, in times of COVID, uh, how important the understanding of uh, our human um immune system is, is for the, the future of, uh, of all of us uh, here on Earth. We have also a big complement of experiments from uh, CNES, uh, our French uh, partner agency, uh, that is, of course, uh, also supporting Thomas during this, uh, this flight. We don't only have uh, experiments, we also have a number of other highlights in this mission. On the 15th of July, the MLM module uh, will launch from uh, Baikonur and uh, attached to that module will be the European robotic arm. Uh, it's a program that uh, we had launched long time ago and we are waiting since long time to uh, commission the, the European robotic arm uh, as uh, a part of the infrastructure of the, the space station. And Thomas will also play a, a role in the initial commissioning of the, the era. And finally, uh, this is uh, just the start for us of a series of mission. Uh, we will have Thomas now, but we will have uh, Matthias Maurer uh, from Germany flying uh, by the, the end of the year also on a SpaceX vehicle to the, to the International Space Station. And then uh, next year, we will have uh, Samantha Cristoforetti flying. So for one and a half years uh, permanently, we will have European astronauts on, on board of the space station. So exciting times uh, for Europe uh, to be there. And during the last part of his mission, uh, Thomas will be the commander and will be able to welcome Matthias uh, on orbit uh, while he is the commander of the ISS. So uh, thank you again uh, very much uh, to the NASA and the SpaceX teams uh, to getting us here. And we are very excited to go fly. Thank you, Frank. We're very excited about the, this international crew flying to this space station. Uh, and they, they bring with them the capability to participate in many of the investigations going on, uh, over 260 during this increment alone. A lot of the focus for the investigations flying on the Crew-2 Dragon uh, will be in the human immune function. Uh, first, we have celestial immunity, an investigation uh, flown by the pharmaceutical company, Sanofi Pasteur, who will be looking at uh, the capability to fly donor peripheral blood mononuclear cells and elicit in them new potential pathways for, immu uh, for immunity. Uh, up next uh, it will be the CHIME experiment uh, for characterizing human immunodeficiency in the microgravity environment. In this investigation we'll be flying tissue chips with a uh, THP1 cell line, it's a leukemia cell line, and we'll be looking for uh, changes in, in the uh, immune response based on microgravity as the stimulating factor. We also have some STEM education flying on the Crew Dragon 2. Uh, that will be the, um, the Storytime in Space 8 demonstration package, which is a heat transfer demo experiment that's going to go along with our, um, uh, our demonstration of reading in space. And that story will be part of our, our celebration of the Australian Literacy Day on May 19th. You can read along with another million plus young readers and we encourage you to participate. Last but not least, I, I would be amiss if I didn't mention we're launching on Earth Day. As Joel said, we've got many investigations on board the, the spacecraft looking down at the Earth, sponsored by our science mission directorate. And we also have the crew who have the best seat in the house for this event, and I'm sure it'll look great. Thank you. And now for a weather update from our launch weather officer, Brian Sizek. And good morning, my name is Brian Sizek. I'm a launch weather officer with the 45th Weather Squadron. And as Benji mentioned, I do wanna emphasize that I'll be speaking primarily to the weather here in the launch area, so the launch conditions. Uh, so uh, unlike the weather we've been seeing over the last few days here in Central Florida, the weather uh, here in the area is looking pretty good for Thursday and Friday. So if we could take a live look at the satellite imagery. So this is the infrared satellite imagery. You can see a lot of cloud cover over Florida right now. And uh, that's due to a front that's kind of just been stalled out 
over our area. We've just had some waves of low pressure riding along it, along it bringing some wet and stormy weather over the last few days. But there is some high, uh, a strong area of high pressure uh, up in the Montana area, and that's going to be coming to the rescue. That's going to be pushing uh, to the south and to the east over the next few days, and uh, that's going to be help clearing out all of that moisture and pushing that front farther to the south uh, by Thursday and Friday. So if we could go to the launch forecast, and you can see we have a 20% probability of violation, uh, so 80% favorable. Uh, the winds are going to be a bit brisk, 17 to 22 miles per hour coming from the north northeast as that high pressure is still centered uh, fairly far away to the north and west, still in control, but uh, it is going to create a bit of a pressure gradient. So the primary concern will be the liftoff winds, but just a 20% chance uh, of that POV. And as we go to the backup day, looking even better, winds die down a little bit, 12 to 17 miles per hour. And as that high slides farther to the east, we are going to see the wind shift to more of an easterly direction, temperature at 70 degrees, and uh, just a small chance of flight through precipitation, but just a 10% POV, so looking 90% favorable for that backup day on Friday. And All that right. concludes my portion of the brief. Thank you so much, Brian. And now we will open it up to uh, questions on our phone line. Uh, I do want to remind folks in order to get to as many of you as possible, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and also let us know who you are asking it to. Um, so we will start with Gina Sanseri from ABC News. Gina? Uh, good morning. This one's for Joel. 11 people on the space station present a certain challenge, sleeping, et cetera. <clears throat> what adjustments did you have to make for this? I didn't quite, I think you said, can you repeat the question? Did you ask, uh, what kind of adjustments do you need to make on the space station for this many crew? Was that the question? Yeah. And so, you know, there's a number of things you have to do. Uh, we have to fly some additional consumables for the extra crew members. Um, of course, you have to look at sleeping arrangements. Uh, we'll have some temporary sleeping arrangements for the, the crew members because we have so many people. We uh, have to increase the capacity of our life support systems, our oxygen generation, our carbon dioxide removal. Um, we also, once we get the crew members on board, they'll first do a, an emergency kind of drill to make sure that the crews are ready for emergencies. But these are standard things that we've done for handovers in the past. So for this one, the, the, the cool thing again is that the added crew member allows uh, another set of hands on board to help us with research and utilization, our technology development, as well as our low earth orbit commercialization. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, next question is from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Marsha? Yes, good morning. Um, my question is for Benji, please. Um, I'm interested in the reuse. When you're flying crews, um, do you have any maximum number of flights um, that you would use the capsule and Falcon 4? And would you anticipate like using the, a, reusing a Dragon capsule every year like you seem to be starting out to do? And spacesuits, can they, can they be altered for reuse, and or do you plan to donate the two behind you? Thank you. Thank you, Marsh. Those are great questions. Um, so first of all, I'm hoping that nobody notices when I take one of the spacesuits home with me after this briefing. No, actually, we, everybody here has asked if they can try one on, but I think there's a do not touch sign. Um, so in terms of the suits, I'll, I'll start there. Um, since I'm making terrible jokes about them, but uh, the, the reality is is that uh, the suits are, are, are somewhat custom tailored um, for each astronaut. Um, and uh, so they are those astronauts' suits, um, and it, we don't really plan to reuse those. There's a lot of crew equipment, though, that we do reuse um, and uh, as part of the overall system. Um, and so, again, we go through the certification and qualification process with NASA to be able to reuse those as well. In terms of your questions about the vehicles, um, the uh, Dragon from the beginning, the Dragon 2 uh, vehicle, which is a, of course has the crew and the cargo variant, designed for five reuses at least. Um, we've been qualifying to that um, and, um, and we've been working with NASA um, on a number of the components to look at five. Um, there are some components that um, we will uh, put new on, you know, we'll replace. Um, some will work through other qualifications and certifications to see how far we can go with reuse for those. Falcon, of course, we used to talk that was qualified for up to 10 flights, but we're continuing to push that um, for, uh, you know, non-human missions, right? We want to see how far we can go. And, 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 and really, again, again, the sort of the holy grail of, of spaceflight is reusability. So it's important that we do that. But in terms of human spaceflight, 
for Falcon. Um, right now, we're, uh, we're working with NASA. We're certified for this upcoming reuse, um, and we're continuing our work together um, as a team to assess how many more flights we'd be able to reuse Falcons for. All right, thank you, Benji. Uh, the next question is from Stephen Clark at Space Flight Now. Stephen? Thank you, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. I was wondering if uh, maybe the LWO or, or Steve Stitch can talk about, or Benji can talk about the uh, forecast for the downrange weather. Um, how are things looking right now? Is it is it looking good? Is it marginal? And when um, when do you tag up to have a, a, a brief on the abort and recovery weather to make that decision whether to load the crew on uh, Thursday morning? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, so, so we have weather briefings uh, starting about 48 hours out from launch. In fact, we had our first one this morning, looking at both days, primarily Thursday and Friday. Um, the launch weather looks really good for both days, as, as uh, Brian talked about. The only concern was really winds around the pad for that very first uh, opportunity on Thursday. Downrange weather is a little bit trickier. As, the, as this high pressure system moves over the, the uh, Arkansas area, that combined with this front is causing some pretty high winds in some of the areas downrange and some pretty high waves. And so we'll have to watch those. You know, of the two days right now, I would say, uh, you know, Friday looks a little bit better than Thursday. We'll continue to watch that weather. I have another briefing 24 hours out tomorrow and, and take a look at those two days. And then we'll figure out what the right time to make the decision is, whether it's tomorrow or taking it down a little closer into launch, so. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question is from Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Irene? Good morning. Uh, my question is for Benji Reed. Um, with the HLS award, how will that impact the development and testing of Starship? And are there any lessons learned already from the commercial crew program that SpaceX plans on folding into the human reading of the HLS system? Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, that's a good question. And obviously, I'll mostly focus on, on, on crew and commercial crew since that's the, the topic of today and our crew two launch and crew one return coming up. But uh, I, I will certainly say that as we, we work with NASA just like we do with everything, as we go through development and development for our use, for other customers' use, we always work closely with NASA in a very transparent and tight partnership. Um, you know, we like to say that we fly because of technical ex excellence and also transparency. And uh, it's, a, it's a key cornerstone of how we work together with NASA. So we'll, we'll always continue that path um, and, uh, and, and do good things in that direction. Um, in terms of lessons learned from uh, commercial crew, that's a, a great question generally and, and applied even here to crew too. Every flight we fly with people on board and every test that we do towards those flights is lessons and data that we use to make flights safer and more reliable um, for other crews in the future on whatever vehicle they may be on. So absolutely, we will leverage all information we have every time for future Dragon flights and for other flights. Um, and even for all of our other customers, whether we're flying cargo or satellites or anything else, we'll uh, always be uh, applying those lessons to look for reliability. Thank you, Benji. The next question is from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. David? Thanks very much. Uh, Benji, I, I think we're hoping you could tell us a little more about Starship uh, than that. And Steve Stitch, uh, on the LOX issue, is it, uh, can you give us a volume? We only heard inches. Is it less than a percent, one or two percent? What, what was the acceptable number of, of volume percentage wise? Thank you. Yeah, I'll address the LOX question first. So um, I don't have the exact percentage of volume. You know, when, when Bill Gerstmeyer was here uh, last Thursday, he talked about a few inches. You know, you know I would say it's on the order of uh, 2,500 or 3,000 pounds of extra locks. And so if you look at the mass of that vehicle, you know, it's a very small percentage uh, of the total weight of the vehicle. Uh, the system can handle that from a performance perspective. We can handle that extra weight on the vehicle. The tank can handle the loading from that extra locks. And then there's a vent system and a contingency that would uh, relieve pressure on the tank if it needs to. It can certainly accommodate that lock. So. Uh, we've had that, you know, SpaceX went back and looked at their flight history and it's been there potentially for some time and lots of different flights with lots of different loading. So when we looked at our specific flight and our the analysis for this trajectory we're going to fly, we felt very comfortable with, uh, with going ahead and proceeding with the flight. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Stitch. Uh, next question is from Ken Kramer from Space Up Close. 
Uh, thank you. Thanks for taking my question, and uh, good luck on um, Thursday or Friday when it happens. Um, I guess my question is for Frank Davina. Um, I'd like to, you to talk a little bit more about the European robotic arm. What uh, What are you going to use it for? What will it, What will missions will it carry out? And can you also talk about the cadence of ESA astronauts? Do you expect them to be there continuously? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken. Yes, uh, great questions. Uh, for the uh, European robotic arm, this is a cooperative program that we have with our uh, Russian uh, colleagues from uh, Roscosmos. Uh, the arm is built in, in Europe, but uh, eventually will be operated by uh, the colleagues from Roscosmos for the benefit of the Russian segment. Uh, I know that they have some airlock relocations, for example, that they want to do with it. Uh, there are a number of science payloads that they want to install at the uh, uh, outside of the Russian segment, so that are the initial operations that are planned for the next uh, year, year and a half, and, and then we will have to see how the uh, era will be used to further enhance uh, the Russian uh, part, uh, the Russian segment of the, the International Space Station. And we are actually in support of our Russian colleagues uh, for the operations and, and, and for the execution of all the tasks that uh, they will plan for, for the European robotic arm. In terms of uh, the cadence of the astronauts, yes, we will now have uh, three astronauts uh, in a row on board of the ISS. Uh, our plan is to have at least one uh, European astronaut mission per year, uh, like we had in the past, to the International Space Station. Uh, and that is uh, for us very important, of course, to continue our scientific program, but also to continue to leverage the support of our uh, European member states for, for the ISS. As you might know, we uh, are starting uh, a new astronaut selection uh, this year. We will have uh, the, the new selectees recruited uh, probably by the end of 22, beginning of 23. And then it's our hope that uh, those new people can all fly uh, to the ISS uh, beginning in, in 25. So therefore for us, the extension of the International Space Station uh, uh, beyond 2024 is of course uh, key and we are working with uh, all our international partners and NASA on uh, moving forward to the extension of the ISS. All right, thank you, Frank. Uh, that will do it for our questions. I know uh, our guests here today have already had a long day and it's only 8.30 in the morning, so uh, we will wrap it up now. Uh, as a reminder, our next media event for this mission is a briefing with the NASA Administrator and others. Uh, that is happening at the countdown clock at Kennedy Space Center tomorrow, April 21st at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And you can, of course, watch it here on NASA TV. Following that is a NASA social event at 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch that live on NASA's Kennedy Space Center Facebook and YouTube channels. Launch once again is scheduled for Earth Day, Thursday, April 22nd at 6.11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Launch coverage here on NASA TV starts at 2 a.m. Thursday morning, just before crew suit up, and live coverage will continue all the way through docking at the International Space Station, scheduled for approximately 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time, Friday morning. For more about this mission, go to nasa.gov forward slash commercial crew. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.